Okay, my wonderful, wonderful friends. You know, everybody says to me, Roger, you're so critical. You're so critical about everybody because they don't understand this or they don't understand that. And I say, no, that's not why I'm critical. I am critical when people refuse as scientists to engage in a discussion. That's when I become critical. Now, this guy I'm not critical of at all. And wait till you hear what he says. He says, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but nobody does, so who cares? Just tell them to do what I tell you, and you'll get an A or whatever. Listen to this. And, this, this. and I am not critical of him at all, because that's all he can say. He's forced to say exactly what his superiors, who are like Einstein and all these people, have dictated this is the story and you go out and tell the story or we will destroy your life. And they tell the kids the same thing. You say what I tell you or I will destroy your life. So that's basically it. Now, I'm not critical of him at all, but listen to what he has to say. We're going to start quantum mechanics and that's all we'll do till the end of the term. Now, I got bad news and good news. The bad news is that it's a subject that's kind of hard to follow intuitively, and the good news is that nobody can follow it intuitively. Uh, Richard Feynman, one of the big uh, figures in physics, used to say no one understands quantum mechanics. So in some sense the pressure is off for you guys because I don't get it and you don't get it and Feynman doesn't get it. The point is Here's my goal. Right now, I'm the only one who doesn't understand quantum mechanics. In about seven days, all of you will be unable to understand quantum mechanics. Then you can go back and spread your ignorance everywhere else. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. I think guys, just as honest as you can be. I, I praise this guy, but I'm going to show you somebody who I do not praise whatsoever. Good morning, my wonderful friends. This is going to be kind of fun. <laughs> this is Derek Briggs. He's from Yale University. I presented, well, I tried to. He re absolutely refuses to engage in my mud fossils and my evidence and my DNA and my caskets and my specimens and my blood and all that stuff. And here he is getting in front of a bunch of kids and saying, it's wonderful to be talking to somebody that actually says good morning when I say something to him. Because everybody, whenever I talk to him, all they do is write down what I say. Because if they don't repeat what he says, he will fail them and they will, he will destroy their lives. Listen to this. When you say good morning, because I've often talked to audiences and you say good morning and they all write it down, which is a little. Yeah, because if they don't say exactly what he tells them to say, he'll fail them. And he is not a scientist in any matter, any way that you can possibly determine a scientist. He refuses to engage in something that is undeniable. So this is going to get pretty serious, I got a feeling. Okay, this goes back to 2015. I tried to present all my evidence to Derek Briggs, Yale University, because I was told he was the only guy that could certify what I had to say. And if he did, if he looked at it, they would, people would look at it. Well, he refused to look at it, so nobody would look at it. They just treated me like an idiot, because if they say Derek Briggs won't look at it, well, obviously we're not going to look at it. He's the director of the Peabody Museum. He's the only one who understands this stuff. He doesn't understand this stuff at all. And I can show you that and prove it, because I tried to submit these things to him and he refused his his um assistant armand hello there armand how you doing my friend uh i told you this day would come when you would be embarrassed and you said and i quote well we all will be <laughs> and you all are all right armand thank you for talking to me because your boss wouldn't he refused and, um, you know, you, you towed the company line, you did a good job, you were always there for me to talk to, to listen to me and say, oh, well, too bad, have a nice day. Well, your buddy, De uh, Derek, is, um, as far as I'm concerned, he should be in trouble. He should, somebody should sue him for, for destroying the evidence, basically, you know, because it, he's in a position to evaluate it and say yes or no. Now, if he refuses to evaluate it, it what is that? Somebody said to me, how could he possibly do that? He's charging people a ton of money to tell them something that he's, is obviously wrong. If you have DNA and you have CAT scans and you have specimens and all that, let me show you what I actually tried 
to show him, and he refused. This was all Homo sapien DNA. And they're gigantic giants. And I'm sorry, that's just the truth. And if you can't handle the truth, you should get out of the kitchen there, Mr. Derrick. Okay, Roger Mudfossil University, I want you to listen to Graham Hancock. This just came out a couple of days ago. This is what we're up against, and we're going to confront it today. So let's talk about it. Which may be very uncomfortable for those who are in power. And, and when what he just said was there are things that are come up that confront what is being taught. And when you're in power, it's something that you want to crush is basically what he's talking about. And I, that's exactly what I found. I'm going to try to do this in a very clinical way. I don't want to be emotional, but it, I, I feel a lot of emotion about this because it's been 10 years. So try to forgive me if I sometimes sound a little bit harsh. But anyway, this is what Graham Hancock to say. And he has the same issue I have, which all of us have had that have come forward you know, fortunately, I was not in the academic realm. Otherwise, I would be sitting somewhere in the poorhouse because they would not accept me. I was outside of that. I had my own business. I didn't care what anybody said about me. And I continued my research for 50 years. And I never turned back from it because I was outside the box. Now, when you're inside the box, different story. And I give them a pass up to this point but it's so overwhelming the evidence that if somebody doesn't step forward now we're dealing just basically dealing with frauds and liars that are taking advantage of the kids and basically that's it the teachers are concocting stories to support what they know now is not true because of DNA and CAT scans and, and specimens and I have them right here in front of me and I'm going to be showing them to you so here's what Graham Hancock has to say and I agree basically with everything he's saying when you're in power you don't like to feel uncomfortable so you do whatever you can to put that down that's a now from an academic's point of view let's say a professor of archaeology he or she have invested their whole career in a particular model of the past that model was already set when they went into the profession right there the very moment they start doing their first exams at university a filter is being applied if they are in any way outside the accepted teaching if they are suggesting that things are not as they've been as they are taught, then they will not pass those exams or they will not do well. In a way, in order to do well academically in that field, you have to buy into the existing model. Because if you don't buy into the existing model, your paper will be marked down and you will not get the results that could eventually lead you to becoming an academic. So by definition, academics are already people who've bought into the model. And now, once you're invested in it, just like you said, your career has to stay within that box. You go out of that box, you lose your career. And I mean, that happened to everybody. Velikovsky was a complete outcast. Tesla, he was destroyed. Um, I have been, you know, I, I, it's not my career, so I don't care. But I, if I was in it, I would have been destroyed because my research has been destroyed. Let's go with that. Um, Graham Hancock, same thing. He's, he's doing legitimate thinking. Now, he didn't have the material evidence that I have to support the things that I'm saying. So now it is no longer being able to hide from it. Now it's being dismissed. And then really that's a legal obligation that teachers have to because they are fiduciaries, which means they are responsible to the students first, not to them first, to the students first. All right? If they have an opinion and they see that opinion it does not hold hold water. It's being contested by factual evidence. They have to address that factual evidence in order to be a good scientist, first of all, and in order to be legally a good fiduciary, because they are there to teach the students how to become educated to get a good job, to become financially viable in a very, very difficult world. And they're doing just the opposite to them. They're saying, take a bunch of money and borrow it, and we'll teach you what to say, and then you can go get a good job. Otherwise, you can't get a good job. If you're not, they, they say, you're not educated, forget about it. You're going to be a, a low-income earner. And that's just the case. So they, they are literally fiduciaries, and their obligation is to the student. Not only that, they are they are really in control of what the students can say. Because if the students 
contest what they're being told. They fail them. And I run into this all through my whole career. I trust me, this is just and everybody has. So I'm not I'm not saying anything that nobody knows. I'm just saying th things out loud that I can say because I'm not in that field. Because if I did, they would crush me. Now they'd say, "Oh, that guy, look, always trying to destroy us or whatever," and they, that would be under me. So anyway, I'm going to tell you how I got into this whole thing. But Graham Hancock, if he would please contact me. I have all the evidence to support the things you're saying, my friend. I have DNA evidence, I have CAT scans, I have specimens, I have anatomists, I have chemistry, I have a process done. No question whatsoever we can support it and we could do a documentary to prove all the things I'm saying. Very, very, very easy. And at that point there will be no more fighting back because the, the evidence will be above the radar and at that, because you're above the radar, I, I'm not there. So let me just go back to what happened to me here. Let me just give you a little background of how I got into this because everybody asked me that and I really don't talk about it all that much. Approximately 2012 or so, 20, somewhere in that area, maybe 2010, I found some things that were, were obviously biological body parts and I went to Dinosaur State Park in Connecticut right down the street from me and I know the people there I used to sit in the back and have donuts with them almost you know once a month or so I because I took care of their electronic equipment uh, that was my business and I so I went up there I thought oh boy they're gonna talk to me no they treated me like an idiot and um, anyway that was sort of hard to take so I went to Yale and Harvard and all the rest of them and there was no interest whatsoever they wouldn't talk to me they refused to talk to me so I said well what can I do? All I have is rocks that look like what I'm saying they look like. And, you know, and I didn't have all the other things to support myself. So I kept after Yale over and over, Derek Briggs at Yale and, and my friend Armand. Hey, Armand, how you doing? And um, they had no interest. And I, I never got to talk to Derek Briggs whatsoever. He just refused and refused to allow me to come with the specimens, even to examine them, which I was very willing to do. Anyway, that's went on for several years. And finally, um, I said, well, I know what I have, so I'm going to get it d d done. I said, what do I have to do? Oh, well, you have to have this, you have to have that. And nobody had ever done the DNA tests on these ancient rocks yet. So I said, I found a lab, Helix Bio Labs, that agreed to do this. And he, it was a PCR DNA analysis that used, enhances the DNA. Well, I didn't even need it enhanced because when I was drilling into the DNA, I was taking really almost literally raw blood because it preserves that well. So anyway, I had three DNA tests done, and two of them said that the DNA was very dense. And then I had seven CAT scans done. This was by Helix Biolabs. Jesse Garant did seven CAT scans for me. And it doesn't show a lot in the CAT scan, other than the outside details fabulous. You can see all kinds of things. But inside, this is a process called nucleophilic substitution. And that means that you got salt waters, NaCl, both sides of the periodic table. What happens is they, in, in wet salty waters, your, your, your body chemistry is very unstable in your body because it's always transferring molecules back and forth using these, these ligands attached to these um, transition metal complexes. They carry molecules back and forth. So you're always in a state of instability. Now when you die, if, or if you cut off the blood to your thumb, your thumb would rot because it, it's not stable. And it, you're given and taken the molecules of carbon dioxide, the oxygen, and this and that, that, that made it stable because you're delivering byproducts that are bad stuff and you're delivering good stuff to keep it you know, biologically active. Once you cut off the blood supply, that's the key. You no know, blood, you're going to rot. So, in salty waters, different story. You cut off the blood and you put it in salty waters, the salt will, in the water, will make the blood metals do the same job they would in your body, only very, very, very slowly. And then you will turn into stone, like that bonehead.
is now stone. All right, and I haven't become blood coming right out of here. I think this one had blood coming out. I could show you a blood clot. Then, this is a, a, a lung. This was on a DNA report, which I will, I'm sure I'll show you. And I drilled up in here. A, a, you, what you do is you clean them off good. Make sure that there's nothing on them. You clean them up good. You find where the blood is. Artery is the best. And, and this is the red. When you find red blood, whoops, you can't see that. Again. When you find red blood, it... Um, it means you're into an arterial area. Red is artery. Black in a mud fossil, like this black looking stuff, that is um, uh, vein blood. It's a different oxygen state. That's all it is. They call it ferrous oxides. Well, that's right. The one with the extra oxygen, Fe2O3, has three oxygens, is the red. And that's that's what they make iron out, iron out of. Very, if it's real, real red, like I have one here somewhere. Uh, oh, here it is. That is almost iron. That's almost raw iron. If they heated that up, what you would get was the best quality iron out of that. But when you have them in the state where they're red and black, you get low quality iron when you burn off all the impurities. So they look for the the hematite. This is hematite. The other one is black is magnetite. And that's a lung. Believe it or not, that is a lung. That's a lung. And that's why it's just loaded with blood. Now, I have the evidence to prove the things I'm saying. And now everything can be tested. So, let's get back to the history here. 2015, I had the CAT scans. Three of them, I mean, three DNA tests. I had seven CAT scans. Gil Headley, who was the top anatomist in the world, basically, was the only one that understood the fascia, which is this pleural coating, and the fascia that coats all the organs and bones and all the things in your body and every separation of tissue. And now fascia is one of the biggest topics on the market now. Because they understand fascia is where your immune system lives. It lives in the, in the membranes between the layers. I actually talked with the guy from Germany. He's, a, he's the director of the Fascia Research Institute over here in Germany. We had a very long conversation yesterday. And we're going to start to try to understand what different types of bacteria live in what different types of environments. Because this bone will have... Ba every bac bacteria lives in every single membrane. That's what protects that membrane from invasion is bacteria. Mucus. The bacteria creates a mucus. The bacteria creates a serosa. That's the attack molecules, they're enzymes. Anyway, different m bacteria live here, then live here. All right, and then you got your hearts, you got your kidney, you got every place has different, you got your intestines totally, totally slathered with all kinds of bacteria. And when you don't have that bacteria, you can't digest what's coming in, so you start losing nutrients and so, so forth. You can't uh, break down the molecules small enough to absorb them. And then if your mucus is not being secreted because the bacteria that lives there died from antibiotics or something, you begin to get invaded through these layers of tissues. There's a lot to learn from mud fossils, and I've learned it all, trust me. I understand exactly how the body works now, and exactly how life transfers molecules during being alive and how nucleophilic substitution comes in and creates flesh to stone. And I have recreated I've done it. It's easy to do. Not a part at all. Now, so here we are at 2015. All of this was done and I will show you what I sent to, well, I sent it to everybody. Nobody responded. So I don't even know if they've got it. To be perfectly honest with you, that's water over the dam at this point but let me go into this because this was a real issue that I was very very upset about and I still am because Scott Walter is the guy that really messed us up Jim Burchell and Arlie Caudle in, in um, Kentucky have a human head and I'll show it to you in a minute and I told the um, I talked to uh, well I didn't talk to Derek Briggs I talked to uh, to Armand and I said, hey, we have this human head, and we want you to take a look at it. Oh, no, 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 you got to do this, you got to do that. You have to have the CAT scan. And I said, all right, well, well, where do we go? And the University of Texas, so that's what we use. And so I said, okay, well, we'll do that. And, we had, and they were very, very nasty. And it ended up, they would not, they were really very, very 
very, very nasty. And uh, so I got kind of nasty back. And the universe tested. Well, they wouldn't answer one single question on it. They would not return a phone call after having a CAT scan done. It was a disaster. I ended up the police and lawyers called me saying, stay away from these people. Don't bother them anymore. Scott Walter gets on TV. And in 20 seconds from the time he laid eyes on this head, and I'm going to show it to you in one second. On TV, he said, oh, I'm absolutely certain it's carved. That was the end of that from TV History Channel, and I, I engaged with him, and I said, Scott, this isn't right. And he did. He contacted me back. He said, well, what do you mean about this? What do you mean about that? And I showed I t tried to tell him. I said, this is, you know, um, these ferrous oxides, that's blood. It's blood. That's iron. That's what ferrous means, iron. And, you know, well, I'm the expert. You don't know what you're talking about. And that's it. The case was closed. And uh, so everybody has that attack a feel that I'm not trying to do attack them. I'm not trying to attack anybody. I'm just trying to have somebody look at the stuff. If they can look at it and contest it after looking at it, I'm okay with that. But they have to look at all this evidence that I'm presenting and then say, okay, the CAT scan's not right because of this. The anatomist isn't right because of that. The, the nucleophilic substitution, that's just all nonsense. They have to come up with some valid scientific response, not just that's not what I was told. And Harvard, the guy from Harvard, told me exactly that. He said, everything you said makes sense, but if you read the books I read, you wouldn't be saying that. And that was um, Professor Reich, I think. I forget. I'm going to name all the names today. We're going to talk, because I got all the history of what, who I interacted with and what they did and what they didn't do. So, like I say, I'm going to just do a clinical analysis of what happened to me and what I think should happen. Okay, as I said, as long as people would investigate something, but a 20-second investigation of this was it was a disgrace, really. I mean, Scott Walter, if he's going to be a forensic geologist, is what he told me he was, and he knows all this stuff and so forth. Well, I said, well, what about the nose? You know, how could you explain the cartilage in the nose and the splaying of the flesh? Well, I didn't see any of that stuff. I said, well, you know, this is ferrous oxide. The red and the black is iron. It's iron oxides. And you have two of them in your body. One is the, the used blood oxygen, and one of them is the oxygenated. And bones have what they call bone black. Now, this guy looked like they had crushed his head in. And Jim, you know, I didn't actually have this in my hands, but I know what the, what this thing is. He said you could take a playing card and slide it right up between the guy's hat and his head. And this is a hat. And I could tell that, too. I said, Scott, if you look at the, he's got a hat. You see the weave? Look at that. Take yourself, take time. What you got to do is take time to look at things and not just rip. That's crazy. It's just all dirt and stone. No, it's not. That's the weave of a hat or some type of you could see it if you take your time and look at it you will see there's something going on there with a hat and you can see the, the the line across his head it looks like a hat or a helmet or something i don't know but um it looked like he got whacked in the head now in the cat scan they did i wanted only one question and it related to the moisture level, and they would not re respond. They just absolutely refused to respond. The University of Texas ended up with lawyers and police calling me and say, "Don't contact these people again," because I, you know, I'm pretty tenacious when I go after something. And I mean, I understand this now fully. And they call this stuff feldspar and sandstone and all that. And that's what Scott Walter said. Twenty seconds. Twenty seconds from the first time his eyes looked at that sandstone. Absolutely certain is what he said. Now, um, or he, he said, I'm, I'm certain. He, well, he said he's po basically, I'm positive that's just a sandstone head, you know. Because Jim said, well, that's what we think. And he, uh, uh, he was real nice. He said, he said, well, how do you think it happened? He said, well, the minerals washed into it and transformed it. It's exactly right. At that point, I was calling it salvomorphism, which means solvents, morph, which change the flesh into stone, salvomorphism, which is long duration flood. After a while, I started to call it fascia facilitated fossilization. <laughs> I'm just like an academic now that I think about it. I keep changing the names. 
<laughs> so it was solvomorphism. Then it went to, I saw everything was coated with fascia. All these organs and body parts and skin is nothing more than fascia, but it's on the surface. Fascia inside your body separates you from everything else. Your, your lungs from your kidneys, from your heart, from your foot, tendons and muscles. So, so then I went with fascia facilitated fossilization. Then I realized that it was basically always happened in mud. Well, I can't really say that, but because there are other exceptions where it, it, it doesn't appear to be there was any mud, like in opals and so forth. Very, very interesting interaction where I don't see any muds. At any rate, um, so I ended up calling them mud fossils. Because they, they, that's, I think they are basically all of these things happen in the Great Flood, and they talk about the Great Flood. So I'm not a religious fanatic or anything. I am a, I, I am a scholar of truth, and that is flat as a pancake. And all of these things happen like that. And it wasn't just these things. I got a goose around here somewhere. I don't know what that is. My buddy, oh here he is. That's a goose head. Same thing. Died flat as a pancake in the flood. It's like that. Now, these are the feathers. That's the feather pattern. It, in the salt waters, it transforms biology into stone. And it is nucleophilic substitution. Look it up. And then start to learn about biology and what everything looks like, anatomy, and the throat, what the looks, how it looks like. And then you realize, wow, that's a guy's throat. But now it's stone, it's basalt. How did that happen? Well, it's nucleophilic invasion. This was in a certain type of chemistry. And the waters possessed a certain type of minerals, metals, whatever you want to call them, elements. And it might have been next to a kidney or a heart or a lung or bile or anything which would have a you know infuse those that chemistry into the waters that this is in because i'm sure there was like huge puddles here and there that that were these things were in until they dried up and then when they dried up somehow they must have been washed out with good clean water and soaked in that for a long time because i've seen other ones that as soon as you take them out of the salt waters they're just well here let me show you a lung and how quickly they can deteriorate in the wrong conditions. That's why I say, in order for this to have happened, it, it must have been preserved in the mud fossil process with the salty transition metal nucleophilic invasion, like I talked about. Very simple process. All it is is watery stuff just goes in there. Now, but it would have to happen, and then somehow would have to have been cleaned out or off with fresh water. I would, that's my interpretation now. Because otherwise I believe this is what would happen, which is, did happen to uh, a lung. Alright, this was uh, a guy over in England, Gary Evans. I've got people all over the world now that are sending me stuff and sending me information and actually sending me specimens and all that stuff. Now, he saw this coming out of this and he thought, well, what the heck is that? So he took it back and he popped it open and lo and behold, this was what was in there. That's the lung. Now, here we have the red blood. You can see red blood. This gray looking color here is blood in a transition between the red, red state and the deoxygenated state. And you can see all the tubing. The tubing is basically inert in blood in, in mud fossils although it will be invaded over the course of very long times I don't know how long this was in the mud I don't think this could have been in the mud for a real long time uh, but this, this is very hard to tell because the outside looked very stony just like where was it uh, you know look at the outside of that lung if you saw that, you'd say, well, that's just a rock. It's just a, con they call that a con conglomeration. But it's not. It's the little particles of the lung having extreme affinity to attach to other, other minerals. Because that's what happens. In blood, that's how blood works. It attaches to other minerals. And that's where it was transferring oxygen 
or this is actually the the, the black deoxygenated blood. Now, that came out, and then this was only after a couple of weeks or a week or two. This is what happens. So the salt, once you wash it out, it must have soaked a long time in the fresh water is all I can think. I don't know, because I know he just washed this out in a bucket or something and took it out, sitting around and dried up, and it turned into literal powder. That will just turn into mud. Now, if he'd have soaked that in for a long duration of time in fresh water, would it have turned solid like this from that lung state? I don't know. Got a lot of work to do, but it can't be avoided anymore. All right, and that's not, it wasn't right to do it 10 years ago. It's not right to do it today. And with all the evidence that I have, it's, it's really very, very distressing to think that the people that are teaching our kids are not willing to engage in anything that would be in their benefit, really. Because I, that's not only this. It's the light research, it's the atomic research, it's everything. And that is also undeniable. No question whatsoever, it's true. And they know it now. And they are changing. They have, they've, they have admitted it. Yes, we can see the particle now. We realize we were wrong. Okay, they admit Einstein's wrong now, and I'm going to tell you what, it's because of this research right here, because I could prove it, and I showed I proved it. That is light, light is light, and it's supposed to only go one speed. Well, we accelerated it. You can slow light down, absolutely, but if you can accelerate it, it means obviously Einstein was wrong, and he was wrong. And light is a particle, it's not just a nothing wave. The particle itself is magnetic. You see the two poles? It's dipole against dipole, two bar magnets. They control a region gigantic around it magnetically. And that is what concussed and exploded at the Venturi right here. It sucked it right out of it. That's accelerating the light. The particle exploded here. The white portion went into shower mode. The black portion separated and went on its own. That's charge separation. I never thought it was possible. But you can see it's quite obvious. There's the black ball, there's the white showers. And who wanted to see that? CERN wanted to see that. And what did they want to see? This is what they wanted to see. The black ball, stay in the black ball. The white ball, which is the electron neutrino, until it concusses, turning into electron showers, the white showers. Now, this is also denied and won't, I, I can't get through the Fermi lab, I can't get through, through the CERN, I can't get through any of them. But now they're admitting it, yes, absolutely, we agree. But they won't discuss it with me. Nobody will talk to me. I, have the, I, I am the one that presented this six years ago. And not a single word up till now because they kept trying to figure out a way they could destroy me and they can't. And now we have suffered the consequences of a destroyed atmosphere because we could have used this extreme amount of excess energy and they wouldn't allow it. All right, one thing I can tell you for sure is nobody could have ever understood about the dark matter and about the electron showers and all that stuff unless they actually saw the visual experiments that I just showed you. Now, here's more visual experiments, and I think I have another little clip coming up that will explain it in much better detail. But if you watch what happens, they were expecting a lattice to appear, but all of a sudden this happened. That, my friends, I believe is dark matter. All right, this is just too cool. These are all of the extra electrons. Basically, every one of these is an extra electron in these particles coming in. They call them ions, they call them charged particles, but they have a charge to them. So what it, what it means, you see how they're stripping out into stripes? That's what I call push to shove. This, every one of these is pushing the next guy and is pushing the other guy back. So they end up causing a line. Now, when they bump up against anybody else here, they push them down, they push them back. So now you get a, a separate line above and below and below and below and below and below. So th these are what they call interference patterns. They're not flappy waves. They are, they are interfering with each other's magnetic regions. I own this much. If you come into mine, I'm going to push you away. You're going to push me away. And if I got somebody in front of me, I'm going to push him away. If I got somebody behind me, he's going to be pushing me. So everybody's pushing each other forward and everybody's pushing each other away. So it's push to shove continuously it creates these stripes. 
Now, as it fills the vacuum that's in here, because there was nothing here, zero, absolutely nothing. As these particles, and they're, they are dust particles, basically, and had, they have extra electrons attached to them, so they are charged. So those electrons are going to be pushed away from the surface electrons, which is the inside coating. Everything is coated with electrons. But they had made a, a, a vacuum in here, so there was absolutely nothing in here. No electrons, no particles, no dust, no gases, nothing. As they enter the dust particles with these extra electrons, those electrons are being pushed all from every other part here. Each one of them is pushing each other away. And then when they get to the center, the dark matter will collect in the center because they, each one of these has dark matter along with it. Once it gets collecting together in a ball, all of the dark matter will go to the center and the white ones will all try to push each other away. That's why they end up in the outside. But they're pushing each other away and these outside of this chamber is pushing them in. So they end up collecting in a ball in the center, which is, I'm sure I just showed you. I sort of get carried away as I do this. But you see all those stripes? That, those are interference patterns. And then as they come in, they just start to jiggle around and say, well, how are we going to get stable in here? Well, we're going to get stable by forcing each other to push and shove until we form our ball. See, they're all sort of trying to figure out what to do. And it looks like they're getting sucked down for some reason down. There must be more mass in the bottom or something like that. Because even the mass of the spaceship, if there's more mass in one, think about it this way. If you just had the covering of the spaceship up here, and then you had all your instruments and all your heavy-duty stuff, and that little jobber was right here, that's going to create gravity. Dark matter just sucks. <laughs> Dark matter sucks. Any, any white matter will be sucked towards that dark matter. It's just basically the dark matter is just intensely strong and it overrides the white matter. So you will always, always, always have your dark matter in the center and your white matter will be glued to it on the outside basically. And a photon is just nothing more than two particles back to back as I have shown a bazillion times.